desperate. They need healing. They need some kind of miracle from God. But everybody else sees it. Come on, that's ridiculous. God is not ridiculous. The gospel here, a person not even looking for it, but they're just confronted by someone that explains the gospel in such a, in such a way that they can see, my God. It has value. Maggie and I were watching a special just recently uh, about from Ray Comfort. I think Josh was watching me, man, with us. He's he's a he's an evangelist. He has a he has a gift to share the gospel, and, and he loves to go to the colleges, college campuses, the universities, and he explains, asks the students that are not born again, don't even know the Bible, what the Bible is saying, but he explains it in such a way, and he has these filmed. And uh, that, the, that the, the students, and I'm talking about, you know, young people, they're adults, and, and he explains it in such a way that they see, wow, it makes sense. There's value there. And then when they see that it's valuable to them, then they want it. So that's what it's talking about here in this parable. So this person uh, that's confronted with the gospel in a way that they can see the value in it, and they've never seen that kind of uh, value before. So the man, this person, is willing to sacrifice everything to acquire a treasure worth more than anything known to man. When the gospel is presented like that, where the person can see, wow, this is valuable. I mean, like, wow, they're willing to make whatever changes are necessary to get that salvation. And that's the way... I grew up in church. They talk about, there's, there's a big preacher down South County who I won't name, that years ago I read an article by him with that the methods that the church was using to get people to come to Christ, that it, it doesn't work anymore. So there's a new way to do it. But let me tell you, that method that the old timers used to get to Christ that they, the modern preachers don't want, touched the world for Jesus. Missionaries went out and won millions. There were revivals in this country with that old-fashioned message. So now they, he's, he, he's been for years teaching people how to do it this new way. And we're not touching the world for Christ. We're losing the world for Christ. We're losing our nation. Because the people have to see value in the gospel. If they see value in the gospel, they're willing to change and give up everything. Because there's value in it. So this is what we want to see here. So this man sold out. He sold out to Jesus. And that's what the Lord is, is uh, showing us here in this gospel of the man that finds treasure, in this parable rather, that he finds treasure and then he hides it and then he does everything he can so he can get his hand on that treasure. And when a person truly comes to Christ, they're willing to do anything. I shared earlier before in the song service of my brother, my brother Reuben, who when he finally got over the backsliding and he found out that there's nothing in the world. He came back to Jesus Christ, rededicated his life. And at that point, he was willing to change everything in his life. And he did. And I'm a witness of that transformation in his life. And what a fanatic, he, in a very good sense, that he became for Jesus Christ. He's well, he was totally sold out for Jesus. That's what Jesus is showing us here in, the, in, in that part of the parable. Now the parable, there's another parable right behind it starting at verse 45 and he said again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one, one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. So we're talking here about the parable of the pearl of great price. Think about a pearl. In ancient times divers uh, brought up pearls from the Red Sea, and I have, uh, I have, I don't know if you've ever gone online, but there's some Christian people that have found real-life photos of the Red Sea, and even modern stuff done by non-Christians, and it's amazing the kinds of pearls and, and things that they find in the bottom of the Red Sea. Remember that Red Sea that Moses and the children of Israel crossed, that God parted the sea so they can cross over? That's the Red Sea there, and that's really called, the, the northern part of the Red Sea is called the Gulf of Aqaba, okay? Pearls of all kinds, it's beautiful in there. It almost looks tropical in there, the photos, and all kinds of uh, sea life in there. So in ancient times, divers, without those tanks, without all the equipment, 
they would just hold their breath and go down uh, in the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and even the Indian Ocean. Pearl, mer pearl merchants were the wholesalers who brought the pearls. They bought them from these divers. They paid these divers, and then they take and they would bring the pearls and sold them as jewelry. All right. So pearls were among the most highly prized possessions. And they were sometimes worth large amounts of money. Okay? Obviously only the very rich could afford that kind of treasure. So what we see here, this parable is saying three things to us also. This parable is saying to us, number one, this parable speaks of not a finder but a seeker. A finder is one who stumbled upon treasure in his daily life. And this is a seeker. This is one who is looking for treasure. So the Lord put these two parables in this, making two points. There are people out there that are seeking. A seeker is one who is looking for something of valuable that he can sell out to. Okay. Number two, there are those who are seeking for something more in life. What are they seeking? Something real, something of greater value than they have known. And I have listened and read testimonies over the years of people that, that have obtained wealth, attained fame. They thought that when they got to a certain place in life, a certain status, got a certain kind of amount of money, then they would be happy, they'd be satisfied, but none of that has brought them satisfaction. And they've tried this and they've tried that. They're looking for something real, something they could sell out to, but don't find it. But they're always looking. They're all around us. Probably some of them are in your family. Some of them uh, might be right across the, the way you work, across the office, uh, uh, across the plant, uh, across the warehouse. Uh, wh whatever kind of job you have, it could be somebody in there. They're working hard, but they're looking because they're not satisfied. One, just one reason that the, that the uh, suicide rate is very high is for people, and sometimes it's young people. They've looked for this, they've looked for that. They've gotten into the, uh, Antifa, they, they've gotten into BLM, they've gotten into whatever, into these kind of groups that are sold out for a cause, and they have found nothing. And, and man, that's why many young people, I don't know what the numbers are, but it used to be some years ago that the number one suicide group was, was uh, young people. And so people that are trying to find something that they can sell out to, but they haven't found it. But they're seeking. Number two, there are those who are seeking for something more in life. Something real, something of greater value than they have ever known. So somebody wants to sell out to it, and somebody is just seeking. They know there's some, somebody better. It's like uh, the atheist says there is no God. Really, there is no such thing as an atheist, because how in the world would an atheist know that there's no God? Did they go even through the universe to find out? It's like a pea, you know, it's like an ant. An ant looking up and saying, well, there ain't no humans uh, alive. There are no humans. Because, you know, they, they just see these big mountains moving around. That's us. Uh, they know. Oh, how about something smaller? Than, what's smaller than an ant, I mean? Huh? No, even smaller than a flea. How about a, how about a dust mite? Those things that they say operate on your bed and we can you need a microscope to see them. Ah, there's no such thing as people. And how do they know? They don't, that dumb pea brain, dust my brain. And there's atheists, they say, well, there's no God. Uh, what do they know? So there's no such thing as an atheist. But there are such things as agnostics. They believe there must be a God somewhere. Like I heard one man say, yeah, but the, the, yeah, there must be a God someplace, but that's his problem. You talk about being disrespectful. That's how bad man can get and how stupid and foolish. But those people can be saved. Okay. So anyway, you have people like that. That they just, uh, they believe there's a God somewhere, but he has nothing to do with us. And uh, they're not interested in the things of God. But they know there's something more. And a lot of our scientists are that way. They're, they know there's something more. They, they know... It's interesting how more and more is reported that more and more scientists are getting away from evolution because they see design in the universe. They see, they see design in, in, our, in our planet. So if there's design, logic tells you there must be a designer, right? But the only place that you find an answer that makes any sense is in the Bible. 
So they know that, so they don't want to tell everybody that. They, they, the Bible has the only thing that makes sense. There is a designer, and there's only one place in, in the knowledge of man that talks of a designer, and that's the Bible. God, you know, God, God is the designer. He's the creator. And they're not ready to make a commitment to God, so they go around making like they're, like they're uh, agnostics because the only thing is God, and they don't want to give their life up to Jesus Christ. So these people, when the day comes that they're confronted with the real thing, I said the real thing, the real thing, the real Jesus. There are a lot of Jesus is being preached. A lot of Jesus is being talked about. And some of the preachers on television, they talk about all this Jesus stuff, but they're not talking about the real Jesus, the Bible Jesus. They're talking about somebody who will make you successful. They're talking about somebody who will make you happy. They're talking about a Santa Claus Jesus. They're talking about some Jesus that gets up every morning out of bed. Just you know, How can I bless my favorite child? They're talking about that kind. That's not the real Jesus. But the day comes when these kind of people that are seeking, hopefully, when they're confronted with the real thing, the real Jesus, when they see him, they'll recognize him as the pearl of great price, and they'll be saved. Somebody who's looking for, is looking for the real deal. Real deal. I remember years ago when I worked at Lucky Stores in the distribution center, you had guys, some of these guys that fit all of these categories, including believers. And some of them would say of this person, of this Christian or that Christian, well, he's not a, he's not a real Christian. He says he is. And these are guys that are not Christian talking about the group that would say they're Christian. And then they would talk about another person. Oh, yeah, he's, he's real. He's a real Christian. He's a real deal. And they would generally, almost exclusively, from memory, respect that person. Even if they didn't worship the God that they worship, but they respected him, recognizing he's the real deal. He practices what he preaches. He lives the life that he talks about. He's not perfect because they knew that none of us are. And they, maybe they've heard that person say that none of us are perfect. Because only Jesus was perfect. When the Bible says perfection in us, it's talking about spiritual maturity. So the, you have people out there that they're looking for the real deal, the real Jesus. And uh, when they finally find the real thing, they'll recognize him as the pearl of great price, and they will be saved. Now, now that we've talked about these parables, let me talk to you about evangelism and presentation. Evangelism is the spread of the gospel. We are the evangelists. You don't have to have a card in your pocket that you're in a denomination and you're a full-time preacher, man or woman, and you are in the office of the evangelist. Okay? The word uh, evangelism comes from the Greek word uh, comes from the Greek word good news. So an evangelist, it can be any Christian that's just going around sharing the good news. Who's the good news? Jesus is the good news. The gospel story is the good news. We were all on our way to hell because we offended a holy God. We were born in sin and we need to come to God and we can't. So Jesus, the Son of God, came took our sin, the sin of man, and he paid the penalty for that sin, paid it at Calvary's cross, gave his life, that whoever believes in him and what he accomplished at the cross could be saved and then receive salvation and eternal life, eternal life from God. Their debt of sin has been paid through Christ. Okay? So the evangelist is the one, you and I, any, any believer who shares that thing. But there's a way to present this good news. So that's why I'm calling it evangelism and presentation. Please notice the importance of presenting the gospel as it truly is. We have to present the gospel the Bible way. Not the way, like I said about a famous preacher who says that doesn't work anymore. There's a new way. There's a new model. There's a new way of presenting the gospel. No, Anything that's outside of this word, it might be a new way, but it's a wrong way. It's a way God will not accept. It's a way the Holy Spirit will not work with. It's not the way. The Bible gospel is the way. So, we're talking about presenting the gospel as it truly is. 
The gospel as it is, as it stands in the Bible, is desirable. Everybody, when they hear it the right way, they desire it. They, it's desirable, it's good news, it's life-changing, and it's powerful. Okay? The Bible said the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, actually the Holy Spirit through him, okay, gave him the words to write. He says that the power for salvation is in the gospel. The, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So sharing the gospel causes, I shouldn't even say cause, I'll use a better word, allows, allows God the Holy Spirit to come on the scene when an unbeliever hears the gospel, present it accurately, the Bible way, you don't have to be a theologian. But when they hear the good news of Christ, and I just share with you what that is, the way of salvation, when they hear that God the Holy Spirit comes on the scene and begins to convict them or convince them that they're that sinner that Jesus came and died for to pay the price for their sin because they're a sinner, they're in sin. And God 